Chapter one, basic insurance concepts and principles is what we're starting with. The first term I'm gonna go over is the word insurance. So insurance, the key word that you wanna look for is the word Chapter one, basic insurance concepts and principles is what we're starting with. Chapter one, basic insurance concepts and principles is what we're starting with. The first term I'm gonna go over is the word insurance. So insurance, the key word that you wanna look for is the word transfer. That's what the highlighted means. The highlighted does not mean that everything is unimportant. It just means that's a word that you should connect with the, the term that we're going over. So read all of it, but the highlighted is what you should connect when you're taking your test, okay? So the word transfer, is the word you want to connect with insurance. So insurance is the transfer of risk from one individual to a company. So an example is if you got in a car accident and you didn't have insurance, that means all, all responsibility for any damages is on you. But if you get insurance, then the company you're covered with is the ones that have to cover that damage, right? What you did is you transferred risk from yourself to that company, right? This is indemnity. Indemnity is to make whole, or another word they might use is to restore. So what this is doing is the company wants to put you back to the way you were before you lost. So let's say you got in a car accident, right? They wanna restore you back to the way you were before you lost the car. So if you crash, let's say a Honda, they're not gonna say like, oh, here's, you know, a Ferrari, they're gonna say, you know, they're gonna say you crashed a Honda, we're gonna give you the Honda, the value of the car that you lost, right? So indemnities to make whole or to restore, we wanna put that person back to where they were before they lost whatever they lost. The next three terms, risk, peril, and hazard, they all are connected. You will see them together most of the time on your test. So you need to make sure you know the difference between the three because if you don't you won't understand which one is the correct answer so the first one we're going to go over is risk risk is the uncertainty or chance of a loss okay so keywords is uncertainty or chance so they all have to do with loss so uncertainty or chance you want to connect that with risk so it's the uncertainty or chance of a loss there's two types of risk there's pure and speculative risk Pure risk is insurable, which means we cover pure risk. Now, the reason is because there is no opportunity for financial gain, only loss. An example is if you give your phone and you dropped your phone, right? Either it's broken or you crack the screen. Either way, you're going to have to spend money to either replace the phone or fix the phone, but either way, you've lost money. So that's why you can get coverage on your car, your house, your phone, life insurance. All of that is pure risk. Now, speculative, on the other hand, is uninsurable, which means we do not cover speculative risk. Now, the reason is because just like pure risk, you can lose, but there is also either a big or small chance of gaining money. Now, an example, a great example that they use in the book is gambling. If you gamble, you can lose, right? There's a big chance you'll lose, but there's also a chance you might win money. And that's why we don't cover things like that, okay? Peril, the next term is peril. Peril is the cause of a loss, the cause of a loss. So if you see cause, you want to look for peril. If you see uncertainty or chance, you want to look for risk. So that's what I'm talking about keywords. Now, the cause of a loss is basically, I like to think of it like kind of cause of death, right? It's kind of like, what is the end result? What, what ended up there? So it's like, if what happened to your car, I crashed it, right? Uh, what happened to that person? You know, they had a heart attack, things like that. Those are causes of a loss. Those are perils, okay? The example they use there is like fire or an accident, things like that. Those are examples of peril as well. Now, the last one of those three is hazards. Hazards increase the probability of a loss. So the word probability is the key word that you want to connect with hazards. It increases the probability of a loss. So there is three types of hazards. So physical is anything you can use your five senses. So it's kind of like if someone's deaf or blind, right? That's a, that's a physical hazard. If you're sitting in a room and you start smelling gas, you're not going to just sit there and be like, wow, I'm smelling gas. You're going to what? Find a way, find, look, 
where is that smell coming from, right? Because it's giving your brain a little like notification saying, hey, something's wrong, right? Or if it starts raining while you're driving, right? Especially here in California, the moment it starts raining, people forget how to drive, right? They, you start driving, there's a chance you could get in a car accident. It starts raining, the chance goes even higher, right? Those are all physical hazards. Now, the next two, moral and morale, a lot of people, what they have problems with when it comes to these two words is the spelling. It's not what they mean, it's the spelling. Some people, whether it's they're nervous or they're just fast readers, is when they're taking their test, they're gonna read really fast. They read the question really fast and they miss a letter. So instead of moral, they read morale, right? They added an E or they saw, they saw moral and it was morale, they took the E off, right? Because you read really fast, if words are very similar, you'll see one instead of the other. So moral, without the E at the end, is something that has to do with emotional, you know, lying, things like that. It's something that you mentally think about and then action is done. So lying, like if I'm sitting down in front of someone and I'm, I'm deciding, you know, I know what the truth is, I know what the lie is, and I'm kind of teeter-tottering between the two options, right? So I'm doing that in my head. Obviously, I'm not going to say out loud, like, hmm, I, I'm thinking about lying to you. I'm not sure, right? Usually that's done in your head. And then once you've made a decision in your head, that's when you go ahead and, you know, do what you've, you've made a decision on, right? So that's moral. Morale, with an E at the end, this is going to be more carelessness, pretty much not thinking, just doing, right? So it's kind of like texting and driving, speeding, any reckless driving. Most people aren't thinking like, should I speed? Shouldn't I speed? They're most likely thinking, I'm running late and I need to get to point B quickly, right? So what are they going to do? They're going to start speeding. And then what happens? They see the, the red and blue lights behind them and then they go, oh shoot, maybe I shouldn't have been speeding but they wouldn't they didn't think about that when they were making the decision they they suffered the consequences after okay so those are the three types of hazards the next thing we're going to go over is just the definition of loss loss is just the reduction of quality quantity or value of something okay that is just the definition of loss the next thing we're going to go over is methods of handling risk so they use a lot of acronyms in this book um if acronyms work for you, that's great. Use them. Write them on, a, on an index card. But if they don't work for you, you don't force yourself to use a study, uh, a study tip if it doesn't work for you. Okay, guys? So the acronym they use is STAR with a double R, and obviously each letter stands for something. So the S stands for sharing. You're sharing risk. So an example is if you live in a house and you're not the only person paying for rent. So it's you and some and your roommates all pay for rent. That means you are sharing the risk of rent. It means that when first comes around, you don't have all that responsibility. It's you and your roommates. Everyone is, you know, sharing the risk of rent. Okay? The T stands for transfer. And remember guys, I told you if you see the word transfer, your brain should automatically think the word insurance right? So transfer is when you buy insurance and you're giving the responsibility over to a company, okay? The A stands for avoidance, right? Avoidance is just, if I told you my biggest fear is to get in a plane crash, well, there's people that go their whole lives and never get in a plane, right? So if my biggest fear is to get in a plane crash, how about I just don't fly, right? Because if I never get in a plane, I never have to deal with it, right? I have an aunt, I've never seen her in all of my years drive on the freeway. She's been on the freeway as a passenger, but I've never seen her drive on the freeway. So she just avoids it. She, she'll drive on the street, but never the freeway. She just avoids that risk, okay? The next one is the R's. Now the R's, it doesn't matter the order in which you put them in. So based on the book, the order, the first R stands for reduction. Reduction is you're reducing the risk. Now, how do, how do you see this most often is like in a house, right? There's smoke alarms, right? Some places, if you go to places, they have fire extinguishers. What are those there for? They don't, you don't want your house to go up in flames, but it's there so that if something does happen, right? 
it, it notifies you to say, hey, you know, let's put this out before it, it reaches the whole building. Now, obviously smoke alarms is, is, is there, so it, it triggers the noise, so you can say, oh, there's something happening, let me go fix it. Another example is, you know, security systems in your house. Now, if you see a burglar coming up, a burglar comes up to your house, and you and your neighbor, your neighbor does not have any security system you do, there's a bigger chance that the, the burglar is going to go ahead and break into your neighbor's house and not yours because you have a, an alarm system. Now, can the burglar still break into your house? Yes. Reduce means you're lessening the risk. Doesn't mean that it won't happen. You're just trying to do the most you can to put the risk down to the lowest it can be, okay? And the last R stands for retention. Retention means all responsibility is on you. Everything, all your self-insured means if you crash your car, you got no insurance, you got to pay for everything. Rent's coming around, it's all on you. Everything is your responsibility. Okay, we're going to go ahead and go into the next page. Six elements of insurable risk. So these ones are six elements of insurable risk. It's kind of like a checklist. So it's like you're looking at the checklist and it's you gotta you know mark one through six off so number one is due to chance now everyone is due to chance so none of us know how we're gonna pass away or when we're gonna pass away we just know it's going to happen right so everyone marks number one off because due to chance it's all out of our control number two must be definite and it must be measurable so if someone was to call me and say you know uh, someone's passed away Obviously, I need to send, you know, proof of that. So definite, measurable, like a death certificate, things like that. You need proof that something has happened, right? You can define it and you can measure it. Number three, must be predictable. Must be predictable. So if I'm sitting down with someone and they say they, you know, they have tobacco in their system, most likely, you know, I'm not psychic, I'm not a doctor, but I can probably predict that most likely in their later years if they don't stop what they're doing that they'll have some sort of you know lung problem things like that why because there's so many people that all do the same thing whether they smoke cigarettes or any type of tobacco and it's not a coincidence that they all end up in the same spot they all have some type of breathing problem lung cancer things like that so can i predict what's going to happen to someone that smokes cigarettes or have tobacco in their system yes so that's why it must be predictable because the bigger the amount of people that have the same risk the more predictable it is number four loss cannot be catastrophic now if you see i emphasize the word cannot on your test they might go ahead and change the word cannot to can it's as easy as that and most people they don't focus on the word cannot, they focus on the bigger word, which is catastrophic, right? So when you're reading really quickly, you'll say, oh yeah, I remember catastrophic, that's, that's not the answer. I'm looking for something else, right? And you, you gotta make sure that you're looking, is it can or cannot, right? So it's cannot be catastrophic. An example of a catastrophic event is something that doesn't happen very often, and when it does, it kills a big amount of people. So an example is, like a hurricane or a tsunami or you know something like 9-11 right that's not something that happens very often but it did cause the passing of many people so that is considered a catastrophic event okay now i'm going to disclose this right now before i continue on there are some things that you'll see in chapters whether it's this one or any of the other ones that you'll say well wait doesn't Primerica do that? And the answer is probably, yeah, we do. But this isn't a Primerica test. This is a state test. So every person in your state that wants to sell life insurance, whether it's in Primerica's company or another company, everyone's taking the same exam. So you'll see some things that you'll say, well, when I was doing my training, we didn't do that. We did the opposite. Well, this is not a Primerica test. Remember, guys, you're learning the things for you to pass your test. If it's going to be Primerica, then you look to your trainer but for this this is just giving you what you need to learn for your test okay 
So number five is exposure must be large. So what that means is exposure must be large is when you have a big group of people that do the same thing, it helps to do number three, which is must be predictable, right? The bigger the group of people, the more predictable that loss will be. So exposure must be larger means you must be a part of a large group of people with the same, you know, lifestyle or same exposure to things. Okay. And number six, it says exposure must be randomly selected. So exposure must be randomly selected. What this means is when we're doing things like paying out death claims for clients, I can't, you know, call up someone and say, hi, uh, you've had a policy the longest and if you don't pass away next, then we can't pay you out. Like, no, the company pays out whoever passes away next. So it's random. It's not, the company doesn't get to choose that. It's random. Okay. Next thing we're going to go over is insurable interest. Now this is very important. Insurable interest. Okay. Insurable interest. First of, first of all, is going to help you find out who's going to be covered in the policy, in the policy. So a beneficiary is not someone that's covered in the policy. They're written in the policy as like, uh, this is the person I'm going to get the money when I pass away. But if they pass away, you know, that policy is not going to pay any money out. The beneficiary is not covered in the policy. They're just in there to get the money if someone in that policy does pass away, right? So a little tip I would write down, guys, is insurable interest has nothing to do with a beneficiary, okay? I would write that down. So if you see insurable interest and they connect it with beneficiary, it's a no-go. That doesn't happen, okay? Insurable interest is who's covered in the policy. So if you see in parentheses highlighted, they say your own life, family members, business partners, et cetera. These are examples, right? Your own life. You can get a policy on yourself. Family members, kids, grandkids, parents, grandparents, your spouse, right? Business partners. If you depend on someone's income and you guys are partners, you can get policy together, et cetera. Another example is, you know, a creditor and a debitor. If you owe money to a creditor, they have a financial interest in you, which means they can get a policy with you in it. Okay. So those are all examples of insurable interest. Now, when, if you see the last bullet point, when should I look for insurable interest, right? When should I be looking for insurable interest is at the time of application. When I'm sitting down at the time of application, that's when I'm asking kids, you have kids, spouse, things like that. Why am I asking? Because I need to find out who's going to be in the policy at the time of application. It doesn't matter what happens afterwards. It all matters what happens right when you sit down with the clients. So let's say I sit down with a couple and they're married. Is there insurable interest? Yes, right? Because they're married. Let's say they get the policy and then years later they get a divorce, but they don't want to change their policy. They're going to keep it as is. Their policy will not be affected. Those two people are still going to be covered in the policy because when they got the policy, they were together, right? Now, if I sit down with that uh, couple when they got divorced, right? They're already divorced and I'm sitting down with them for the first time. Is there a share of interest? No, because they're no longer together, right? So it would have to be two separate things. So insurable interest is when we sit down with the client at the time of application, it doesn't matter what happens afterwards. The law of large numbers, we kind of already went over. The law of large numbers basically states the larger the group of people in a group, the more predictable the loss will be. So if there's five people or a hundred, I'm going to get a more accurate prediction from the hundred than the five. Okay. The next one is the adverse selection. So adverse selection, the definition is the tendency of less favorable risk. Now, when I was studying for my test, I read that and I said, I don't even know what that means. Right. And it's okay for you guys to be studying and read something and go, I don't know what that means because you know, studying for the test is like learning another language. So find a different way to understand the term, right? So adverse selection, the tendency of less little risk, a lot, a lot of people like me, I, I always thought of the pool story. The pool story is 
you're hosting a pool party. Everyone that comes to your pool party, you're liable for, which means if someone drowns, who's responsible? You are. So you're not going to just let anybody into your party, right? You're going to make sure that you're, you're choosing and picking who's coming in. So let's say the first person walks up and they're an Olympic gold medalist swimmer. You going to let that person in? Definitely, right? You, you let them in, you'll say, you can be, you can be the lifeguard because you know that person isn't going to drown, right? The next person comes up and they're in their 20s. They've been swimming since they were like, let's say seven, eight years old, right? So more than half their life. You going to let that person in? Yes, right? Because now they're no Olympic gold medalist swimmer, but you know that they're not going to drown. So you let them in. Third person comes up and they're like, oh, I just learned how to swim, right? I could do like the doggy paddle. And, and you look at this person and you're like, I don't know if I want to let this person in, right? So let's say you do let them in. But before you let them in, you reach into a bag next to you and you whip out some floaties. You say, I got some floaties for you. You put the floaties on the person, you let them in. You say, don't go in the deep end, stay in the shallow. If you want to go in the hot tub, you can go in the hot tub, but stay out of the deep end. So what did you do? You let the person in, but you were more strict on them, right? You put the floaties, you, you, you're you watching them more than the, you know, the Olympic gold medal swimmer, okay? And the last person comes up and they're like, swim? I don't know how to swim. I drink water, I drown, right? That person, you're already like, nope, nope, no, no, I'm not letting you in, sorry, right? Why? Because you don't want to be responsible for that person. Now, this is what the company does, right? We look at different applications and we say, you know, this person's in great health, great weight, everything, we're going to approve them, right? They're going to be our client. This person's not healthy, but they're not unhealthy. They're just normal, right? We'll take them. This person has something like, let's say they have diabetes, they have something, but it's controlled, right? That means that we can predict what's going to happen. So we cover them. We're going to cover them, but we're going to charge them more because they're higher risk. And the last person is someone that's too high of a risk. And we're just going to say, sorry, you're denied, right? There's someone there was, that got denied coverage because he got in too many car accidents, right? And car accidents are very high risk. So the company said, no, we can't cover you because there's a big chance that you'll get into another car accident and you won't be so lucky. Okay, next one is utmost good faith. Utmost good faith, truthfulness. Utmost good faith, truthfulness. When I'm sitting down with a client, right, and I ask them, like, what's their height or what's their weight, and they tell me whatever they say, right, let's say they said, I'm 5'6", and I weigh this much. I'm not going to go and reach into my bag and pull out a scale and a tape measure right? Whatever they told me, I'm going to say, I'm hoping whatever you're saying is true because you're hoping whatever I'm saying is true. So utmost good faith is just everyone hoping and, and, you know, we're hoping everyone is just telling the truth. Okay. And the next two both do the same thing. They both say, Hey, this is how much insurance you need, right? So they both determine how much insurance you need. The difference is what do they look at to determine that? Okay, so the human life value approach and the needs approach both do the same thing. Now, a little testing tip, if you're reading a question and you see, you know, human life value approach and needs approach as one of your four options, you can automatically eliminate the other two options because you know it's either going to be the human life value approach or the needs approach. So then if you really don't remember the difference, at least now you have a 50-50 chance of getting that question right. Now, the human life value approach looks at future. What does that mean? If you see the second bullet point, it says calculates life by looking at the val looking at the insured's wages, inflation, years to retirement, and time value of money. So what does that mean? They're looking at how many years till you retire? How is money going to look, right? How much how many years till you retire? How many Second bullet point says calculates life value by looking at the insured's wages, inflation, years to retirement, and the time value of money. What they're looking at is how many years do you retire? How is your income going to look? How is everything going to be uh, price-wise in the future, right? Not right now, but later. Everything that's going to happen. Now, the needs approach, second bullet point says factors considered include income, amount of debt, including mortgage, investments, and other ongoing expenses. So what are we looking at? 
How much do you own your house? How much money do you make right now? What are those ongoing expenses? Those are your bills, right? How much do you own your water bill, electric, things like that? Those are all happening currently right now in your life. So if we look at anything current, we're looking at the needs approach. If we look at anything that's going to happen or future, then we're looking at the human life value approach. Now, the next thing is the business uses, business policies. A little tip, a business policy, any money paid out on a business policy, any money paid out on a business policy is going to be paid out for the business. So you can't use that money for personal use. It has to be used for the business, okay? So the first thing is key person insurance. Key person insurance is, let's say I owned a restaurant, right? And you were my manager of the restaurant. You opened the restaurant, you ran the restaurant, you hire the staff, I own it, you run it, right? So if you passed away, would I lose money? Definitely, right? Because if you passed away, who's gonna open the restaurant? Who's gonna run the restaurant? right? So I would lose money if you passed away. So what I do is I get a key person on you, right? So that if you pass away, the business will get a sum of money so that we can hire somebody new and we don't lose money because one person passed away. Now, if you see the, the bullet point says business is the if you see the last bullet point it says the business is the applicant, the policy owner, the payer, and the beneficiary. Now, did the employee put any money in? No. Did the employee get any money out? No. The business is the one that applied for the policy, that pays the policy, right? And it's the one that's going to get the money out of that policy when someone passes away. The next one, buy and sell agreement. Now, this is for business partners. If me and you, we own the business together, I pay half, you pay half, well, if you passed away, I can't pay it all by myself. And if I passed away, you can't pay it all by yourself. So what do we do? We're gonna go ahead and get a buy and sell so that if one of us passed away, the other person would get a sum of money to still pay for the restaurant or the business so that we don't lose the business just because one of the partners passed. Okay, 